the oaths establishing the 30 years peace were sworn in the year 45, uh, 445. And that leaves, as we know, of course they didn't, uh, or about 14 years before <coughs> the Great Peloponnesian War will break out. Uh, and uh, although we only know a little bit <coughs> about <coughs> the events between the two wars, uh, what we do know, I think, is interesting, although not easy to interpret evidence about the character of that peace which we've been talking about. <coughs> One way to determine whether the peace was a true peace with a real chance of lasting and controlling international affairs for a good long time, <coughs> or whether it was really a truce <coughs> uh, that merely interrupted a conclusion to a war that was inevitable, I think that can be tested to some degree <coughs> by the events <coughs> that took place in those 14 years or so. I think we can be, one critical question, of course, is quite apart from the objective elements of the peace, maybe more important than those are the intentions <coughs> of the two sides. And I think it is, perfect, it is possible to arrive at some sense of what that, those intentions were. <coughs> There's little doubt that Pericles, still in the position of the leading politician in Athens, <coughs> clearly the man who was the, uh, I think, the, the negotiator for peace on the Athenian side, if I'm right about his invention of the arbitration clause, <coughs> um, that would suggest he was very much personally involved in shaping the character of that peace. It seems plain that he really was sincerely committed to a policy of preserving peace for the future for as far as it could possibly go. <coughs> One reason is that several uh, years before <coughs> the peace, indeed before this war had broken out, the Athenians had made a peace with the king of Persia. The negotiator on the Athenian side was a man named Callias, and so it goes down in, in the book says the Peace of Callias. <coughs> this is about as debated a subject as there is in the history of ancient Greece. Was there really a Peace of Callias or not? Was it a formal peace or not? Even in ancient times, some writers question whether this was a historical fact. <coughs> I won't trouble you with all the arguments both ways, but let me, uh, let me indicate my own op opinion is that there actually was a formal peace, but it doesn't matter whether that's true or false, because nobody doubts <coughs> that there was a de facto peace between the Athenians and their allies on the one hand <coughs> and the Persians for uh, a good long time and that it is not broken until well into the Great Peloponnesian War, when in the year 412, there is a treaty made between Sparta and Persia, which brings Persia into the war against the Athenians. So there's this considerable stretch of time when there is peace with Persia. <coughs> now, about the same time, rough, uh, the year, uh, the traditional date for Peace of Callias is 449, and about the same time, <coughs> We are told only by Plutarch, so some scholars have questioned the historicity of this too, that Pericles called for a great Panhellenic Congress <coughs> to discuss a variety of questions, but one of them was, uh, how shall we keep the promises we made after the Persian War <coughs> to rebuild the temples to the gods that had been destroyed by the Persians in that war? <coughs> And how shall we see to the um, freedom of the seas? Now, um, the question, of course, the, uh, the temples of the gods that had been destroyed in the Persian War were essentially all in Attica. So that <coughs> here was a, uh, an occasion where the Athenians alleged, were apparently hoping to bring all the Greeks into the picture to help pay the costs of restoring those temples. 
it was an Ath Athenians who would benefit it from it most. But also, th maintaining the freedom of the seas <coughs> meant providing for a fleet that would keep the Persians out and keep pirates out and so on. The Athenians obviously had that fleet. The result of having the, if the uh, Greeks had all in fact participated in this activity, it would have been <coughs> a way of legitimizing both the Athenian Empire <coughs> and <coughs> of course the navy that uh, made it great, but also it would have legitimized the plan that Pericles had in mind and which we know he carried out to the best of his ability immediately <coughs> to rebuild those temples and indeed to build some new ones as well on the Acropolis and elsewhere in Attica as evidence of the greatness uh, and the glory of Athens. This building program was going to be at the center of his uh, domestic concerns for the rest of the period we're talking about. <coughs> he invited all the Greeks, but as it turned out, the Spartans and their friends chose not to show up. <coughs> you can see why, uh, for the reasons that I have in fact just given you as to why this would be attractive to Athens, that's why it would not be attractive to Sparta. <coughs> there is some debate, did Pericles ever expect <coughs> that the Spartans would accept or was this just his way <coughs> of making it clear that since the Spartans and the other Greeks would not participate in these activities, Athens was right in going about it unilaterally. One of the things that it would do if the Athenians were now to say, well, the at, at when the Spartans didn't show up and their allies didn't show up, they said, if they won't keep their promises to the gods, we will. <coughs> That provides justification for building the first of the great temples he was going to put up on the Acropolis, the Parthenon, which was going to be the great marvel of the Greek world uh, thereafter, <coughs> and which was going to be very expensive, and which he was going to use league money for. This would legitimize it, he hoped, and it would be a, an argument for doing that. As for the uh, a claim that <coughs> they needed to preserve the uh, freedom of the seas, that would be a le give legitimacy to the existence of the Athenian, uh, of the great fleet of the League, which was paid for by League money. In other words, it would give legitimacy to the Athenian Empire. <coughs> no doubt he thought that was necessary because having made a f either <laughs> That's why I like the idea that he did make a formal peace with the Persians, but <clears throat> in either case, with it being obvious that there would be no more attacks on the Persians that the, uh, and that the Persians were out and that they were not a threat anymore, why should the Allies contribute their ships and money? And by the way, by this time, most of them were not contributing money and the Athenians had man were manning all of the fleet. Why should this continue if the war with the Persians was over? Pericles never imagined that the Athenians would give up <coughs> their fleet, their empire, the tribute that supported all of that. So he needed to have uh, a reason <coughs> for doing that. And so my view and that of many other scholars is that the Congress decree as it is called certainly had that as a motive. Was he serious? What, what would he have done if the Spartans had said, sure, we'll do that? I think he expected that they wouldn't. But he was prepared to have them do that because if they would, they would contribute <coughs> the money, presumably that was necessary, and they would also grant legitimacy to what the Athenians were doing with their navy at sea. <coughs> and of course it would be a, a wonderful situation because it would create a kind of uh, a unity between the two that would help keep war away and Pericles' plan for using all of that money from the treasury for his building program required peace. If the Athenians were going to be at war, that money would not be available. So for all of these reasons, he did what he did. My guess is he, he anticipated the likely outcome, and, uh, that, but it doesn't mean that he was unprepared to deal with the situation if it had been otherwise. <coughs> there I think we see the first bit of evidence that leads to my opinion that Pericles was very sincere about preserving the 
the 30 years peace, that he saw that and hoped it would be the instrument by which there would be, you know, who can talk about perpetual peace, but at least <coughs> peace for the foreseeable future. Another event that, uh, a much debated one, that casts some light on what's going on, occurs in the year 443. <coughs> in that year, the Athenians agreed to help establish a colony in southern Italy at a place that they called Thurii. Now, there are several things about this colony that are interesting, and perhaps uh, as, as interesting as any, is that it was different from any other colony we ever heard of in the Greek world before this time. <coughs> you know the picture of what a typical apoikia is like. It is the colony of a city, and that city is its mother city, and you know all about those relationships. There were rare occasions where a couple of cities might get together and jointly be the mother cities of a town, but that's all. <coughs> this colony was established from the first as a pan-Hellenic colony. In other words, it was not an Athenian colony, even though the Athenians took the lead in establishing the colony, <coughs> even though the Athenians uh, appointed the critical players in establishing the colony. The founder, the Oikos, was an Athenian. Uh, Pericles sent along uh, the leading seer, the leading religious figure in all of Athens to be uh, helpful in the founding of that city. Uh, Herodotus, a good friend of Pericles, who also, of course, was the father of history, went out there presumably to be the historian of the new city. Um, What's in there? Hippodamus, the great city planner of the fifth century BC, who uh, was famous, you, you might not think this is such a big deal, but it is. He, he uh, applied simply right-angled streets in founding the new city, when of course all the old cities had been founded, as I described Athens itself, with streets that just developed out of old cow paths that just wound all over the place. So the modern grid structure <coughs> was the work of Hippodamus. Uh, all of these guys were friends and associates, part of the brains trust, you might say, of uh, Athens under Pericles, and, and these guys went out and established the colony of uh, Thurii. All of these uh, elements are interesting. <coughs> Why a Panhellenic colony? Well, for one thing, uh, I should point out, too, that Pericles had seen to it that the membership of the colony consisted of people from a variety of places. <coughs> and it's interesting to point out that although the Athenians had the greatest single number of people in this new colony, when that colony's constitution was drawn up, <laughs> I forgot, um, what's the name of the... Uh, Sophist, Protagoras <coughs> laid out the constitution <coughs> for this uh, <coughs> new city. Again, he was a friend of Pericles. <coughs> it was divided up into 10 tribes, just like Athens. It was a democracy. The, the constitution was very much influenced by the Athenian model. <coughs> and <coughs> as I say, one of the 10 tribes, and remember, the 10 tribes have to be equal <coughs> in order for them to present the necessary regiments in the army. Only one-tenth of the people were Athenians, even though there were more Athenians than anybody else. But there were several tribes made up of Peloponnesians, not from one particular city, but all from the Peloponnesus. <coughs> I make those points because I, I want to make it clear that if you just look at the percentage of the population occupied by Athenians, <coughs> it will not allow them to dominate the city. <coughs> this really is a Pan-Hellenic colony. Why? My view is that Pericles was attempting to make a very significant point here. After all, this, uh, this colony was established in reaction to a request <coughs> made by some Italian Greeks who uh, were having trouble in their own city, needed to found a new one, needed more people in order to make it viable, went to, to Sparta, the Spartans said, we're not interested, went to Athens, and the Athenians said, yes, will help you do this. 
Now, the Athenians could have said no. Or they could have done the normal thing if they wanted to say yes, make it an Athenian colony. <clears throat> Why did they come up with this brand new idea that nobody had ever seen? In my view, it was because Pericles was glad to have an opportunity to demonstrate something about <clears throat> Athens' intentions now and in the future. That was the best way to advertise the fact that the Athenians were not interested in expanding their power out to the west. Because if they had been, they would have made it an Athenian colony. <clears throat> Other scholars have taken the, the opposite view and think it is a sign of Athenian imperial interest, which would have said practically the day after the treaty was signed, Pericles and the Athenians were already <clears throat> Uh, violating the spirit of that treaty. But I think that is easily demonstrated <clears throat> to be wrong. All we have to do, well, first of all, what I've done already is to look at the internal character of the state, and if you want to argue, that is not the way to start an imperial venture in the West. Set up a colony that's not your colony <clears throat> and that has only got a tenth <clears throat> of its population being Athenian. But other evidence, I think, makes it all the clearer. <clears throat> uh, only a year after the foundation of the city, it went to war against a neighboring town, <clears throat> the town of Taras, which became the Roman town of Tarentum, modern Taranto. <clears throat> Taras was one of the only Spartan colonies. So here you have a Spartan colony fighting against an uh, Thurii, whatever that is. <clears throat> Imagine for a moment, though, <clears throat> it were an Athenian colony, as the uh, people of a different view say. What does Athens do? I think that's really critical. The answer is nothing. Taras defeats Thurii. Then, to rub it in, they take <clears throat> Uh, some of the spoils of victory and place them at the uh, uh, at Olympia where the, where the games are held where all the Greeks can come and see in which they boast about their victory over Thurii. <clears throat> what do the Athenians do about all this? Nothing. This is not the way to behave if you're planning to start an empire <clears throat> in Sicily and southern Italy. <clears throat> so I think that's a very serious blow to the theory of imperialism out there. And then, a few years down the road, we get to the year 434-3. <clears throat> the crisis which will produce the Great Pel Peloponnesian War has already begun. So everybody is looking ahead to the coming war between Athens and Sparta. <clears throat> At that time, there is a, uh, a big argument breaks out <clears throat> within Thurii. Whose colony are we? Once again, a terrific <coughs> indication <coughs> that nobody thinks it's an Athenian colony right off the bat, although in the argument, the Athenians claim, well, it's an Athenian colony. I mean, the Athenians in Thurii say, we're an Athenian colony because there are more Athenians than anybody else. <coughs> Whereupon the Peloponnesians say, yes, there are more Athenians than anybody else, but there are more Peloponnesians than there are Athenians. So we are a Peloponnesian colony, we are a Spartan colony. Well, they couldn't agree. And so they came to the decision that they would allow um, Apollo, through his oracle at Delphi, to decide. Well, that's an interesting thing, too. <clears throat> Who does the oracle at Delphi lean towards? We've had very clear evidence of it in the 440s. <clears throat> they are pro-Spartan. The Spartans have been the defenders of the priests uh, as against the Phocians from the outside. <coughs> There's every reason to believe <coughs> a decision made by the priests of Apollo will favor Sparta, and it, that's not what happens, though. But the priest says, you are not an Athenian colony, you're not a Spartan colony, <coughs> you are my colony, says Apollo. Very nice way out of the fix. But one thing they're not is an Athenian colony. Now, what do those imperialist Athenians do about it? Nothing. <clears throat> to my mind, that absolutely undercuts 
any claim that Athenian imperialism in the West explains what's going on out there. But why, what's going on out there altogether? Why did he establish it at all? Why did he establish it in the way that he did and why did he react or not react in the way that he did? <coughs> My suggestion for which there is no ancient direct evidence is it was meant specifically uh, by, uh, to use uh, current modern terms, this was a diplomatic signal. <clears throat> Pericles wanted the rest of the world, and most especially the Spartans and their Peloponnesian allies, to know that Athens did not have ambitions of expanding their empire onto the mainland or out west. I think what was understood by the Thirty Years' Peace is the Athenian Empire as it exists in the Mediterranean, I'm sorry, in the Aegean and its front boundaries and to the east in the direction of Persia. <coughs> That's the Athenian sphere of influence, again, to use a modern term. <coughs> Everything to the west of that, the Athenians are going to stay out of and leave alone. And my view is Pericles <coughs> delivered <coughs> that message uh, in his behavior in concerning Thurii. <coughs> And he would have known, I believe, that the number one state who would be concerned about what was happening out west would be Corinth, <coughs> because the Corinthian chain of colonies and the Corinthian major area of commerce was in the west, Italy, Sicily, <coughs> and such. And so it was the Corinthians, I think, whom, to whom he meant to send this message. And in a little while, we'll see how that works out, uh, how that, uh, w whether it worked or it did not. But it seems to me that is the only way to understand these events that I have been putting together. But having said that, I remind you that other scholars don't understand it that way. This takes us to the year 440, <coughs> when another critical event uh, tests the peace. The island of Samos is, has been an oligarchic regime. <coughs> it has been <coughs> one of the biggest states in the empire. <coughs> it, is, uh, it has been autonomous, that is to say it has its own fleet, its own government, which is again oligarchic, not democratic, the way most of the states are when the Athenians conquer them. <coughs> Uh, but the, and in that uh, state, there is a rebellion. It comes about because of a quarrel between the Samians, an island, I remind you, very close to the coast of Asia Minor, and the town of Miletus, that famous city of philosophers, which is just across uh, from Samos. And in between the two, on the mainland, is a very small town called Priene, and each town, each uh, one of these states claims <coughs> Uh, so it's a classic uh, quarrel between Greek poles about territory that's between them. Now this presents a very special problem for the Athenians when you think about it. <coughs> On the one hand, the Athenians hardly want to get into a, a fight with Samos, an island of great power and importance with whom they have been associated for a very long time. On the other hand, how can the uh, hegemonal power of an alliance allow the big fish in the alliance to eat the little fish, which is what would be happening here? <coughs> that is in, unacceptable if you're going to uh, have a, a proper hegemonal relationship with these folks. So the Athenians tried to um, sort of split the difference as best they could. <coughs> they offered to serve as arbitrators in this dispute, and thereby to avoid war. Uh, Samos would not hear of it. <coughs> the Samians, of course, expected to beat Miletus, and they would have done that. <coughs> they were, in the process of doing what they were doing, asserting true autonomy as against the Athenian version of it in the past. But the Athenians couldn't permit that. <coughs> it's again one of these confrontations in which each side, from its own perspective, has right on its side, <coughs> but these two concepts of right are inevitably in conflict and problems occur. Well, the Athenians, when they are told that the uh, Samians are turning down the arbitrators and they're fighting against the Milesians, 
Pericles immediately puts a fleet together and sails across the sea and puts down the rebellion by force. And then he takes the steps that the Athenians have typically taken against rebellious states over the last uh, <coughs> decades. That is, he establishes a democracy, put an end to the previous regime. He takes hostages from the rebellious aristocrats or oligarchs <coughs> and settles them on a nearby island to be sure that these uh, people will behave. Um, other than that, <coughs> he imposes on them an easy settlement. He does not uh, do any great does, does not do any harm to anybody, doesn't execute anybody, doesn't take away people's land, doesn't uh, exile all kinds of folks. He doesn't do that. Uh, and so his expectation, and I guess his hope, would have been that uh, that would be that. From now on, Samos would be a democracy and therefore reliable and friendly, and there would be no further trouble. The, the hostages would help make that secure. But the defeated oligarchs did not accept defeat. They went to the Persian satrap <coughs> inland from Ionia, his name was Pisuthnes, and asked for his help. And he gave it. He sent a force, and the first thing they did was to go to the island where the hostages were kept, take those hostages back and return them to their friends and families, and thereby took away this restraint against further trouble. And now the uh, Samians overthrew the democratic regime that had just been placed in power and started a, an oligarchic revolution. Now that's very serious right away, <coughs> but more serious than that is on the news that this had happened, the city of Byzantium, which became Constantinople, which became Istanbul, located at this vital <coughs> strategic place on the Bosphorus, also rebelled. <coughs> we are told later on in Thucydides that at some time, and he doesn't date it, uh, there, the um, island of Mytilene, of another one of these big, independent, important states with, with a navy, also uh, was thinking about rebellion. And I, mean, I go along with those scholars who suggest this is the time when they were doing their thinking. So <coughs> Athens is suddenly confronted by a danger that they have really not faced before. On the one hand, their empire may be in general rebellion soon if this thing spreads. <coughs> Secondly, the Persians have actually taken an aggressive step against the Athenian Empire by assisting <coughs> the Samians in their rebellion. Now, we don't know, and the Athenians couldn't know, whether Pisuthnes had acted in accordance with the instructions of the great king, or at least the wishes of the great king, or he was just running an independent operation. The, the first would be a very, very serious problem indeed. It would mean a major threat from Persia, the second would still be moderately serious. <coughs> I think we have to, I, we can't be sure because there was no time for Pisuthnes to consult the king and everything is happening bang, bang, bang and it takes um, uh, months to get to uh, a message back to Susa where the great king lived. So it's in the first instance, Pisuthnes is certainly acting on his own. The question is, does he, does he really know how the king will react or not? We, we can only guess about that. But here we go. There are two, two parts <coughs> of the uh, Trinity that will mean disaster for Athens. If we look ahead to the Peloponnesian War and examine what was it that defeated Athens and put an end to their empire, it was the combination of rebellion in the empire, assistance to the rebellions by the Persians, and the third critical step, of course, was that the Spartans were also in the war and ready to, and in fact they did, invade Attica and fight against the Athenians on land. And it's that third critical element <coughs> that is decisive right now here in 440. The Spartans call a meeting 
of the Peloponnesian League to discuss the question of should we make war on the Athenians at this time? And that would consist of invading Attica. And had they done so, we would have had, as I say, what was necessary to defeat Athens <coughs> in the Great War. Now we know later on, when the final crisis in 432 and 431, 433 actually is when the speech I'm referring to takes place, a critical part of the story of bringing on that war was the attitude of the Corinthians. As we shall see, the Corinthians in 430, starting in 433 at least, began agitating for war. And their agitation, I will argue, played a critical role in bringing the Spartans to fight. What do they do now? On that occasion, when they were uh, on the brink of war, the Corinthians went to Athens and tried to argue the Athenians out of taking steps that the Corinthians thought would push the war into reality. And they said this, why, when the Samians revolted from you and the other Peloponnesians were divided in their votes on the question of aiding them, we on our part did not vote against you. On the contrary, we openly maintained that each one should discipline his own allies without interference. Now, that's critical. What they're saying is there would have been an agreement to go and attack Athens. We stopped it, was their assertion. Now, that statement cannot be a simple outright lie because the Athenians and everybody else in the Greek world by now would have known what happened in that meeting. <clears throat> Possibly they're exaggerating their role, but what they cannot be doing is misrepresenting the position they took against the war with Sparta. My question is why were the Corinthians and who were so annoyed by the Athenians, remember, <clears throat> It was their, the Athenian alliance with Megara against Corinth, about 461, 460, that started the Pel First Peloponnesian War, and as Thucydides tells us, uh, was the source of the hatred of the Corinthians for the Athenians, and yet here we are in 440, and they are making a critical position against the war. My answer to that question is Thurii. I believe that when Pericles and the Athenians sent that diplomatic message, the Corinthians received it, thought they understood it, and it changed their policies. So long as the Athenians stayed out of their bailiwick, they were prepared to preserve the peace. So I think that's a very important story if you agree with that <coughs> uh, analogy. Peace was very rigorously tested in 440. And peace won out over a tremendous temptation <coughs> to go to war. That leads me to believe that peace was possible. And I would argue still further that <coughs> having passed this great crisis, <coughs> having passed this test, chances of peace were better than ever. <coughs> because the two sides <coughs> had acquired <coughs> reason to trust the other, to behave by the rules as they had been established. There is one small point, but which turns out not to be so small, which I'll come back to, which is the Corinthians' <coughs> interpretation of precisely what that peace meant, I think will turn out to be not exactly what the Athenians thought that it meant, and that would be serious when we get down to the final crisis. But in 440, my assertion is <coughs> the Samian Rebellion demonstrates that war is still not necessary. What has been established in the minds of both sides, this I think is <coughs> perfectly clear, is what uh, we would call in the modern world a balance of power in which the two sides recognize the other really as equals. <coughs> Where each has established a sphere of influence uh, out of which the other is to stay. And that uh, this is satisfactory. The Spartans, you know, they, the, the issue about the Spartans and the argument about their behavior <coughs> at this time <coughs> comes down to this. <coughs> One scholar 
wants to emphasize the fact that the Spartans even thought about going to war against the Athenians. And if that hadn't been true, there never would have been a meeting of the Peloponnesian League. That's true. <clears throat> he takes their decision to call the League as evidence that they had decided to go to war and were talked out of it by the Corinthians and their allies. That's not the way I see it. I think that the Spartans in 440 were in the same position they were in, or I will argue they were in, uh, at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, <coughs> divided, <coughs> uncertain. The more aggressive Spartans were tempted by the terrific opportunity the Samian War presented. The more conservative and traditional Spartans were uh, reluctant to start another big war against the Athenians. And <coughs> the, uh, the Hawks had enough power to compel them to consult their allies, but how their allies reacted was going to be decisive. And so I think that, <coughs> uh, my, my reading of it is that the conservative Spartans were normally the majority of the Spartans, and it took a very special set of circumstances a special set of conditions that to move the Spartans to war, and the Corinthians saw to it that that was not going to happen. Uh, be warned that all of this is a matter of interpretation. <coughs> there is no certainty about it. And, uh, and, and Thucydides himself, who I think, and most people would agree, thinks that <coughs> the war was going to come anyway, regardless. Uh, he doesn't express opinions about these actions that I'm talking about. <coughs> as to whether they did or did not influence the course of events. But we have that evidence and we have to use it and think about it. My conclusion then is after uh, the Athenians are now free <coughs> to put down the rebellions at Samos and at Byzantium to restore their empire, <coughs> and they will use the remaining years before the final crisis to strengthen their control of the Aegean Sea and of their empire in the east. <coughs> Again, some scholars who think the war inevitable um, will say this strengthening of the empire was in fact itself a growth of Athenian power, and that seems to me to be a great stretch of, of the understanding of that word. What it is is a consolidation of what they already have, and there's no evidence <coughs> that <coughs> the, uh, these actions that I'm talking about frightened the Spartans or upset them. And, and that's worth a lot because we hear plenty of complaints about what the Athenians are doing in the final crisis, uh, and, but nobody makes any reference to these events that <coughs> some scholars think show Athenian uh, growth. <coughs> so there we are. Again, a crisis has been overcome. My argument is no reason in the world <coughs> why the two sides should fight each other in uh, in the absence of some new thing that changes circumstances. That brings us down precisely to the final crisis. So I've been telling you the war is not inevitable, so now <laughs> I have to tell you why did it happen? And that's what I'll try to do. <coughs> it starts where Thucydides, of course, uh, shrewdly begins the story, having told you the story of how Athens came to be an empire, how Athens and Sparta came to divide Greece between them in that first portion of his uh, history in book one. <coughs> we get to what I think is uh, chapter 24 in the first book where he suddenly moves to where the crisis began. And where does it begin? It begins in a town called Epidamnus, <coughs> which is located on the western shore of the Greek peninsula on the Ionian Sea, it is, um, um, I'm trying to remember, what was the, uh, oh yeah, it was called, uh, was it Dyrrhachium? Curtis, is that right? Yeah. Can't, uh, in Roman times it was called Dyrrhachium. It was on a, an important road system that they had. But <coughs> in Greek times it was out nowhere, is what I'm trying to suggest to you. It was not even on the way to anything very important. It was, um, I, I always, I'm reminded <coughs> of the term that Neville Chamberlain used when suddenly war threatened about 
a place in the middle of Europe called Czechoslovakia, and uh, Chamberlain said about it, a place, a faraway place of which we know nothing. I would have been embarrassed to say that even in 1937. <coughs> uh, but it's really something about epidemics. I mean, it, it's, it's out, way out there in the middle of nowhere as far as the Greeks are concerned. Nothing is important about epidemics itself. This is one of the many occasions in which great wars start in places that are inherently insignificant. But certain <coughs> aspects of the situation make them significant. In this case, <coughs> The most important aspect was that Epidamnus had been founded by uh, Corsaira, the modern island of Corfu, located not too far to the south <coughs> of Epidamnus. By the way, I should have told you that the town uh, of, Ep of ancient Epidamnus today is in Albania, uh, and it's, I can't pronounce, I don't know how Albanians pronounce things, but my best attempt is Dures but I'm not sure that's right. D-U-R-R-E-S. <coughs> anyway, um, the uh, Corsarians established the colony there centuries ago. <coughs> but Corsaira was a colony itself of Corinth. But as I told you early in the semester, it was a very unusual <coughs> colony. Its relations with the mother city were most unusual. They, uh, Thucydides reports that the first trireme battle in all of history was fought between Corinth and Corsaira in the seventh century. And there are repeated wars between Corinth and Corsaira, just about one a century, sometimes more frequently. <coughs> and it's very clear that by the time we are into the 430s, these two cities hate each other. <coughs> and they hate each other with a traditional hatred, handed on down from century to century. <coughs> this is a very critical part of comprehending what takes place here. <coughs> anyway, sometime, maybe around 436, a civil war breaks out <coughs> within the city of Epidamnus in what is not unusual by now in the Greek world. It's about <coughs> Democrats versus oligarchs. <coughs> And the uh, uh, one side has control of the city, the other side is driven into exile. <coughs> the exiles uh, get help from the barbarian tribes in the neighborhood because we're really talking about the frontier of the Greek world. They are not surrounded by fellow Greeks. They are surrounded by non-Greeks. So um, there they are when the people who are besieged send a delegation to their mother city, <coughs> Corsaira, asking for help from Corsaira in bringing peace to the city uh, and in putting an end to the siege uh, which they are experiencing there. <coughs> well, the Corsarians are not interested. Their answer is no, we, we, we don't want to help you. Uh, there's no evidence they care about which side wins. They are simply being, uh, they see no point in getting involved themselves. <coughs> <coughs> An important part of the story of Corsaira and its significance in the coming of the war is that it was neutral towards everybody. It was not a part of the Peloponnesian Confederation, it was not part of the Athenian League, and it wasn't associated with anybody else. In fact, it had a reputation, if you can believe the Corinthians, <coughs> of being terribly uppity and unassociating with anybody. I guess if you asked the Corsarian, he might have used uh, Lord Salisbury's term for Great Britain late in the 19th century as enjoying splendid isolation. It wasn't too many years before Lord Salisbury and others realized that isolation wasn't so splendid as they thought. <coughs> And so it was with Corsaira. But for the moment, the Corsarians say, oh, who the hell cares who wins your stupid civil war? Take a walk. <coughs> so they did. Well, and I should say they took a boat ride. Uh, they went to Corinth. Now, this uh, demonstrates an incredibly important principle of human behavior. What do you do 
If you go to mother and you ask her, can I have the keys to the car or whatever it is you need? And she says, no. You go to grandma. You know what grandma will say, right? You know, the old story about the grandmother who somebody rush, rushes up, tells the grandmother, uh, your grandson has just taken a, a neighbor's child and throw him out of a thrown him out of a third floor window. Grandmother says, oh, bless him, such strong hands. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, the Corinthians react as grandmother might. That is to say, they s agree to send help to the besieged um, Epidamians, <clears throat> they also agree to send um, an army, which uh, first they will send a fleet, then they'll send an army which will go there as well. And they, are, they also are willing to uh, recolonize the city because of course the city is now divided between two sides. So if, they're going to, if the people inside are going to win the war ultimately, they're gonna need new citizens. They're not gonna wanna take back those people who are trying to kill them. So the, Athenian, the Corinthians organize a new colony to join them. In other words, they give them every kind of help <coughs> that anybody can imagine. Now, if we look for a reason why the Corinthians should have been willing to make this enormous contribution to this faraway argument, scholars have had a field day for centuries trying to figure out what the tangible benefits are with absolutely no luck. There is no evidence of that is persuasive at all that there are economic benefits to Corinth that are significant if they somehow have control, no matter what style control, <coughs> of Epidamnus. And so I think we are driven back, as we should have been driven in the first place, to Thucydides' explanation, who himself asks the question and answers it about the whole quarrel between Corinth and Corsara. And he refers simply to the hatred that the Corinthians felt towards the Corsarines. When you get to that passage, take a good look at it. Uh, because Thucydides understands that we're all gonna raise our eyebrows a bit. And so he tells us a tale. Why is that so? He says, because every year <coughs> the Corinthians hold a religious festival in their city to which all of their allies send delegates. This is very normal. And all the other delegates treat them as you should treat a mother city, with deference, with respect, with gratitude, with kindness. What do the Corsarians do? They abuse them publicly. They, they call them names. They treat them like dirt. They insult them in front of all of the, uh, in front of the family, so to speak. <coughs> And therefore, the Corinthians hate them. And out of this furious dislike, that, that is what their actions are about. This has made scholars in the modern world very nervous. They understand that there are only two things that make people fight one another. One of, well, yeah, that's pretty much what they used to say now that I think of it. <coughs> and many of them still do in, in, in the face of what we see in the world today. Uh, one is, Money, that is economic gain. Thank, we can thank Marx for that, and for a whole century or more, people couldn't understand that people ever do anything for any reason except for monetary gain. There isn't anything in this to explain it. It just won't do. There's no, scholars have failed in attempting to show how that might be true. The other has to do with power. <coughs> uh, you know, relationships, uh, if you, if you have this state on your side, it will give the balance of power to you and so on. But the truth of the matter is, the epidemic is essentially irrelevant to the ordinary struggles of power between these two states, uh, Corinth and, uh, and uh, Corsaira. Corsaira won't be poorer, it won't be weaker if the Corinthians have epidemics. <coughs> Uh, nor is there some kind of a tremendous strategic edge if you can launch your attack from Epidamnus rather than from someplace else. No, no, there's no reason to doubt Thucydides about this. This is about honor, and it's about dishonor. Now, does that sound very remote? Who cares about honor in the 20th century, 21st century? What, is, what kind of nonsense is this? I will tell you 
that you and everybody around you and everything you see in the world today is motivated more frequently, especially conflict, but other things too. The way you lead your life is uh, influenced more by considerations of honor than of anything else. If some, and I'm, let me put it in the way that's most helpful in this context, it's really the negative that's important. More important than honor is dishonor. People hate to be dishonored. They hate, there is a wonderful slang word that now tells the story. It wasn't available when I was a kid. The thing was available, but the word wasn't available. If I say to you, he dissed me, do you know what I mean? Do you think there's a danger to your teeth if you dissed the wrong guy? Do you doubt that that sort of thing motivates individual people constantly? And I can show you, and already shown the world, that uh, it motivates nations constantly today, not only 20 years ago or 500 years ago or 2,000 years ago. That's what Thucydides is showing us here. This is a very important permanent truth. This is why Thucydides is so superior to modern political scientists studying international relations. They don't understand these things, and Thucydides did. So that, I think, is what is happening. And when <coughs> it becomes clear to Corsaira that Corinth is involved, that they are looking for a fight, and that they have dishonored Corsaira by taking over one of their colonies, the Corsarians are, on the one hand, angered, but on the other hand, they're frightened. Because Corinth is a great, powerful state, and more important than that, Corinth is one of the most significant allies of Sparta. If the Corinthians are giving us grief, the Corsarians could think this is a prelude to having the Peloponnesian League come after us, and that is not something you want to happen. So the Corsarians ask for a conference with uh, the Corinthians, and uh, they come and say, Let's, let us uh, find a way to make peace over this issue. Let's see how we can negotiate a peace. The Corinthians are adamant. They say, you want peace? This is what you've got to do. You have got to withdraw your forces from the city. Here you are be, uh, uh, besieging the city. And uh, let me see. Yeah, they're right. Because the Corsarians have come with their fleet. They have defeated the, uh, you know, I've been, um, I always get this so backwards. Let me see if I've got this right. What are the Corsarians doing? Curtis, are they on the side of the guys inside or outside? Do you remember? They're on the inside. Yeah, that's right. But they have now, uh, their armies are in the field and their navy is on, at sea against the opposition to the folks who are inside the city. <coughs> and um, so the Corinthians say, you are, you are fighting these people and you're asking us to talk peace while you're fighting these people. You withdraw your people, and then we'll talk peace. Well, of course, that would give the advantage to the other side. And the Corsarians said, no way, and said, tell you what, we'll withdraw our people if you withdraw your people. The Corinthians said, no way. I think what comes out of this back and forth is important. It's, it is that the Corsarians are not looking to expand this fight. They want to end it not because they're peaceful and lovable fellows, but because they're afraid of where this thing will go. We are now dealing with another uh, term that came into fruition in the 20th century. <coughs> Escalation is what these guys are afraid of. We've got this little fight going on here, but next thing you know, we may find the Peloponnesian League involved. But the Corinthians clearly aren't worried about that, and that's going to be a point we have to cope with. They, um, um, right, the, Corinth the Corsarians say, look, if you don't work this out with us now, we may have to seek allies, other allies besides those we already have. Well, Thucydides has told us they don't have any other allies. But who are these allies that they're going to seek? Uh, that's a real question. Somebody tell me. 
Athens, of course. I wanted you to tell me because I want to emphasize how obvious it is. Nobody could have missed the signal. This is a threat. <clears throat> we know you Corinthians are playing as tough as you are because you're counting on the Spartans to assist you. Well, if you do, we will ask the Athenians to help us. And then what? And so the, the situation goes forward. The Corinthians are not bluffed, if it was really a bluff. And uh, uh, on they go. Um, it, but I should point out that at this um, meeting, the Corsarians said they were willing to submit this quarrel to arbitration. I remind you again, not mediation, to turn it over to a third party and have them settle the question. The Corinthians turned that down. I think that alone indicates uh, who wanted war and who wanted peace at this point. <coughs> um, the other thing is that um, um, it should be remembered that the 30 years peace <coughs> provided that neutrals were free to join either side that had signed the 30 years peace so that when they th were implying and threatening an alliance with Athens, they understood that the Athenians were free to accept them into the alliance without breaking the 30 years peace. That would be a considerable issue as the problem grows more difficult. <coughs> well, there is no peace. And so the two sides organized their navies. The Corinthians did not have a large standing navy in peacetime and they set to work to put one together. In 435, there is the Battle of Leukimni, which takes place between the, the uh, Corinthians and the uh, um, Corsarians, and uh, the Corsarians win. <coughs> Corinth is not deterred. Now they really go to work, <coughs> and they build <coughs> for them a vast fleet <coughs> consisting of 90 ships, unprecedented outside of Athens. And they do turn, not in, a, in an official way, but unofficially, to their Peloponnesian allies, asking them to contribute help too. And their Peloponnesian allies send another 60 ships. And so the Corinthians have available a total of 150 ships. The, Cor the Corsarian fleet, consisted of 120 ships. They did have a fleet that they kept at all times, and that had given them the confidence in advance to do what they had done. <coughs> but here was Corinth suddenly outnumbering them in this way. Corsara was now thoroughly frightened. They knew that Corinthians would be coming after them again with a fleet that was bigger than theirs. So they went to Athens in September of 433. And now I, I ask you again to imagine yourself <coughs> sitting there on the Pnyx in Athens in September of 433, as <coughs> the Corsarian ambassadors have come to your town, they're gonna ask you to join in an alliance with them for the purpose of fighting the Corinthians and their friends. The Corinthians who have heard about this sent ambassadors of their own to Athens. They are present on that same hill and they will make their case as to why the Athenians should say no to that request. Thucydides reports his version of both speeches. There's every reason to think he was sitting there in the Athenian assembly on the days in which these discussions took place. The essence of the Corsarian <coughs> argument is that, well, here are, the issue, here are the points they make. Corinth is wrong. It is not a breach of the 30 years peace for Athens to accept the Corsarians into their alliance because neutrals are permitted. <coughs> then they go through a lot of stuff to show that the Corinthians are bad guys, making arguments on the grounds of uh, morality and virtue and decency and obeying the law and all kinds of stuff but it's clear that that's not what's on their minds. They are talking about, um, uh, basically they, they try to convince the Athenians on the grounds of the significance of their decision for the balance of power and essentially the balance of naval power in the Greek world. <coughs>
They, in passing, they make the point that Corsara is very well situated for a naval, or I, should, I mean for a, a sea voyage to Sicily and Italy, where the Athenians and others are always wanting to go, so you want to be on our side. <coughs> That's not really a very potent argument because no town, no uh, polis shuts its ports to any other polis except in wartime. So it's only, when they mention it, they only have to be talking about why it's valuable to be allied with Corsara because, and this is their most powerful underlying argument, there's going to be a war. Don't kid yourself, Athenians, is what they are saying. And when that war comes, you're gonna wanna be us, you're gonna wanna have us on your side in part because of our convenience, our strategic location. On the other hand, more powerful is the fact <coughs> We have 120 ships. If those 120, if we lose, if you let the Corinthians beat us, our ships will fall into their hands, and then they will have a much mightier fleet than even the one they have put together. And now your unquestioned dominance of the sea will be challenged. That's what's at issue. And don't imagine that this is just uh, anybody's imagination. This is going to happen. The war is coming. An enormous amount of what's happening here has to do with your perception of whether war is now inevitable and whether or whether by, by restraint you can preserve the peace. <coughs> That's the problem that the Athenians face. Now, it's a terribly interesting one because it happens so very often on the brinks of wars when that's the issue that determines what people will do or, or, uh, and, and how they react. If they don't think that taking a certain action, or, or I'm sorry, they don't think the war is coming anyway, they may very well decide to refrain from an action that might provoke a war. If on the other hand they think war is coming, they, f they feel that it's too dangerous not to make our capacity to win the war more likely. And so they may well take a step which makes the war more likely. Uh, and they're both gambles. Nobody knows for sure, one way or another. You have to make an estimate, and that's always the way it is. <coughs> Unless you are simply an aggressive state and all you want to do is conquer and you don't care about anything else, you're always trying to figure out, will it be safer to fight or not to fight? Will it be safer? to try to make a concession, or will that make it more dangerous? Those are always the issues, always the problems. Uh, one of the great imbecilities that I discover all through my life as people will contemplate going to war at different times in our time is the quiet assumption, unquestioned, un unexamined, that restraint, the failure to take action, is safe. N taking action is dangerous, whereas our experience, even in my lifetime, has demonstrated that's often wrong. Nothing could be clearer to me, and I think to most people who studied the subject, that not acting against Hitler as he took one step after another to rip up the peace of Europe was the most dangerous thing they could possibly do, far more dangerous than confronting him early, as early as 1936 when he invaded the, the Rhineland. And that's not the only case of it. There's, there's no simple rule. Sometimes it's wiser not to act and sometimes it's wiser to act, but it's never clear which one is more likely to produce peace and safety. And that's what the Athenians had to wrestle with uh, on that day. The Corinthians responded to the argument of the Corsarians, denying their picture of things. They said, in fact, if you sign up with the uh, Corsarians now, you will be in violation of the 30 years peace. What they were saying, I guess, in, in the abstract was, don't worry about the letter of the law of the treaty, because that clearly permits an alliance. It's the spirit that counts. They said, surely nobody imagined that this decision would be made at a time when one of the people who are the neutral was asking you to join in was already at war with one of us. Surely nobody had that in mind. They're certainly right. Nobody did. 
uh, the question is, on the legal point, my guess is the Athenians had the better of the argument. It says in black letter law, it says you may take a neutral if the neutral asks you for an alliance. There's nothing that says except that if, when that neutral is attacking us. It doesn't say that. On the other hand, who in his right mind could imagine it would be okay to do that? So that was one issue that the Corinthians spoke to. Um, <coughs> But they, they made another point that was legalistic as well. And this one, I think the case of the Corinthians is much worse. They, they said the principle established in the 30 years peace was that each side could punish its own allies without the interference of the other side. Now, as a matter of fact, it didn't say that. But the other thing that's wrong with that statement is it's one thing for Athens to punish Samos, which is an ally, and ask, and the Corinthians saying, fine, that's your business, we want to intervene. But Carcyra is not the ally of Corinth. In fact, they are bitter enemies of yesteryear. There's no part of that treaty that protects the Corinthian right to attack Corcyra. So <clears throat> it's a great argument if you don't look at the validity of the, the facts that are alleged. Corinth's got a very bad case here. But their really important argument is this. The, Corinthi the Corsarians say the war is inevitable. Well, it isn't. If the fact is, they tell the Athenians, if you were smart, the thing you would do would be to join us, and together we'll smash the Corsarians, and then there's no more problem. Uh, but if you don't do that, at the very least, refrain from joining them because then we will be friends, and then we will have peace in the future. But make no mistake about it, if you do accept the Corsarians into your alliance now, then there will be war. War is not inevitable, but your action can make it inevitable. So that's what the Athenians confront <coughs> when they have to make their decision. I'm, again, I, the drama of this is so striking, I want to be sure you conceive of it. They are sitting there, all, everything I've told you so far has been said on the same day. And now the Athenians start talking about what should we do. It's the same day. The people who are sitting on the Pnyx, if the day is clear as they used to be in Athens just about every day, can look out across Attica to the north and they can see that area into which the Spartan and Peloponnesian army will march and start destroying their farms three days from now, possibly, if uh, a war starts. And who is going to be doing that fighting out there? We will. Those of us who are sitting here voting whether to go to war or not. Uh, I'm always struck by the, immediate, the immediacy and the, the significance of what these guys are doing. Somebody tell me this is not a democracy, please. So it is, of course, the same kind of thing they faced back in uh, 461 when they had to decide whether to take Megara into the alliance again. There are significant differences, but the issue is very much the same. <coughs> uh, they can't be sure. Maybe if they back off and refuse the alliance, maybe that will be the end of the problem and they'll live happily ever after. On the other hand, if they're wrong about that and the Corinthians take over this fleet, suddenly they will find themselves vulnerable in a way they have not been since they put their empire together. I always find it illuminating to me anyway, and I hope to you as well, to make an analogy to Great Britain <coughs> at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Great Britain, at the beginning of the 19th, uh, it, 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 sort of in the middle and after in the 19th century, came, had the greatest navy in the world, without question. It was the greatest power in the world. It had this enormous empire that it ruled. <coughs> and it, uh, it looked, um, its, its vulnerabilities were mainly against France and Russia, who were two imperial rivals in the areas that the British cared about most. And they typically, they, at a certain point, they decided to make their fleet to be the size of the next two fleets put together. 
in order to feel secure in case a war broke out. And that's what they did. <coughs> Everything was fine until Kaiser William becomes uh, the emperor of Germany and uh, towards the end of the, 20th, of the 19th century decides that Germany must be a great naval power, it must be a world empire, it must challenge Britain for that uh, opportunity. And they begin to build a fleet of battleships whose only purpose can be to destroy the British fleet and to allow the Germans to invade Britain and thereby, or, or best of all, to intimidate the British uh, into stepping aside and allowing the Germans to do what they want to do. <coughs> as soon as the, this becomes clear to the British, as soon as the Germans start building that fleet, it is not yet strong enough to defeat the British fleet. And the British enter into a naval race to see to it that they don't get to be big enough to take out the British fleet. But uh, it's very costly. The British don't like it. They try to find every way they can. And what they do is completely flip their diplomacy, which has dominated their behavior for over 100 years. And they make an alliance with France and Russia to see to it that the Germans are checked and prevented from doing what they're planning to do. I think that does help to understand what the, what the Athenians are doing. When you are, as in the case of Britain, an island state, as in the case of Athens, you might as well be an island state because you are dependent on imports for your food supply, and the command of the sea is essential for acquiring that. In such a case, it is not an, a light thing to permit a change in the naval balance of power, which may make you seriously vulnerable in case of war. The point I want to make is that the British didn't wait until the Germans had equaled their force. They changed their policy and ultimately <coughs> moved into war to prevent it. And that's where uh, the Athenians, I think, found themselves. It was something they were not willing to do. But it was a very hard call. And we are told that they argued so long that it got dark before the decision could be made. Uh, Thucydides says it was thought that they were inclining against the alliance when it got dark. They met again the next day, and this time they voted for something a bit different from what they had been talking about the day before. What the uh, Corsarians had been requesting was a typical alliance, the only kind we know of between Greeks, a sumachia, an offensive and defensive alliance. It would have required the Athenians <coughs> to uh, go out and fight the Corinthians, even if the Corinthians didn't attack Corsari. It would have put them fully at war against the Corinthians. That's not what the Athenians voted. On the second day, they voted on the proposition that they established something called an epimachia, which means a defensive alliance only. They would only fight against an enemy if that enemy had attacked Corsaira and was in the process of landing on their territory. And so uh, that's finally what the Athenians did. That was the vote they took. Once again, we have something unheard of before, a, a device, which is in a way largely a diplomatic device, meant to have consequences on thinking rather than immediate military results. So I say it's got to be Pericles, but I feel better this time because Plutarch says it was Pericles, even though Thucydides doesn't say who made that proposal. <coughs> It was clearly what Pericles wanted because he holds to it very, very firmly in both directions, both in terms of the limit that he's, this puts on Athenian action, <coughs> but on the determination to take that action no matter what. What I suggest to you is that we are going to be dealing from here on in, we've been dealing with in a general way anyway, but now it's very clear, this is Pericles' policy. I assert it is a policy intended to keep the peace. And here again, we run into a problem in our own time in which sort of the normal reaction of people is if you want to keep the peace, what you want to do is to be a nice guy. 
What you want to do is to make concessions. You want not to frighten the potential enemy. You want to show that you have no ill will towards him. And then reason will prevail, and you can all have a nice chat and go off for tea. <clears throat> of course, that's not the way it is at all. One way, always, that has been used by nations in the hope of keeping peace is through the opposite device of deterrence, where there isn't any hope of coming to a happy agreement, because if there had been, you wouldn't be in the spot you're in now. All you can do is try to indicate to your opponent that he will not achieve the goals he seeks if he launches a war against you. And so that requires that you be very strong, <coughs> militarily strong and strong in the way in which you negotiate. On the other hand, if that is your goal, deterrence, then you also want to be very careful not to behave in such a way that is too frightening, that indicates to your opponent that you are likely to defeat him if uh, he allows you to be as strong as you would like to be. You want to uh, uh, be avoid taking an action that will make him lose his rationality, that will make him so angry that he will forget about these questions of uh, success and failure. He'll just say, I'm going to get that son of a gun. And that, I argue, is the policy that Pericles pursued, an attempt at deterrence and moderation at the same time, to frighten the uh, opponent by his determination out of thinking they can do what they want without a danger of war, but also to avoid inflaming his uh, anger. In the short run, what happens is that the Athenians send to assist their, uh, their Corsarian allies a fleet of only 10 triremes. They're this is inexplicable, in my view, except in terms of the, the strategy that I have suggested. What he's doing is sending, really not a force, but a diplomatic message. He is telling the Corinthians, you have been counting on the fact that we would stay out of this. Well, you were wrong. We will not allow you to defeat the Corsarian Navy because we find that unacceptable and dangerous. So we're sending this force to help the Corsarians, not because we want to fight you, but because we want you to see that we're serious about this. Don't start the fight. Well, the, the Corinthians sail their fleet against Corsaira, and there follows a battle at sea called the Battle of Sibota. And Thucydides describes the, uh, the battle itself. Very tough battle. The Athenians are, oh, I, I'm sorry, I haven't told you one thing you need to know. Um, the Athenians will line up at one end of the, Corinthia, the Corsarian line with their 10 ships. The commanders of that fleet are determined as well. Those 10 ships are commanded by three generals. That's a lot of generals for, for 10 ships. But one of them, who is the chief figure there, is Lacedaemonius, the son of Chemon. Well, of course, he is clearly seen by everybody else as not one of Pericles' boys, not a stooge of Pericles. He's an independent, and what else, what's his name mean? Mr. Spartan. Now, if the Athenians get drawn into that battle and the command that we should do so is done by Lacedaemonius, then of course that will not have the effect of dividing the Athenians but it will make it much harder to divide the Athenians. It will be much easier to say all Athenians, even those who have the kindest attitude towards Sparta, thought that this was a necessary step, which I think was aimed not at Corinthians so much. It was aimed, of course, at Athenian politics, but I think it was aimed at the Spartans too, because then the, if the Spartans were then asked by the Corinthians, so look what happened, come in and help us against the Athenians, they would have to face the fact that even Lacedaemonius thought this was necessary. It's the same game. All of these are cagey moves by Pericles to pursue his extremely complicated, tricky kind of uh, strategy. And I see that I have run over my time. So I'll pick up the tale next time.